The Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies presents The Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, The Heavenly Prologue. In Moses 2 and 3, what it is, Moses is in the presence of God, and he's been given his being given his assignment, one and three here, and we read in the first verse, however, that he had been caught up. So this is an ascension. There is a great branch of ancient literature called the ascension literature that's emerged recently, and we have lots of ascensions here. The uh, some of the most interesting ascensions are in the Book of Mormon, because First Nephi, one eleven and following, there's a very important ascension there where he tells us, what is it? Is it heaven or earth or what? It's the exceeding high mountain and all the rest. But he says uh, it's uh, right in the first chapter, right at the beginning of Nephi, because in the beginning we have a prologue in heaven, you see. But uh, in the 11th verse, they... Uh, well, uh, I got the wrong one here. First Nephi, well, let's look at Second Nephi 4.25. Wait a minute, he says that. Well, let's look at 7 Nephi 425. That's, that's another ascension. He says the same thing there, so it's all right, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'll find it. I, I'm just making too many mistakes these days. Uh, these days, indeed. <clears throat> Upon the wings of my spirit hath my body, notice, my body been carried up, carried away upon exceeding high mountains. And mine eyes have beheld great things, even too great for man, wherefore I was bidden that I should not write them. Oh, I see what I did. I put the dots in the wrong place. It's 11 and 1, not 1 and 11, because the first chapter does have a real prologue in heaven. But if you look at the 11th chapter of 1 Nephi in the first verse, I put the first chapter, rather the girl put the uh, first chapter in the 11th verse. There's a difference. <laughs> we say it doesn't make any difference. No, but it does. And uh, yes, the first chapter, first verse of the eleventh chapter. But came to pass, <clears throat> after I desired to know these things, my father had seen. Remember, he'd been carried away too. And believing that the Lord was able to make them known to me, I sat pondering in my heart, and I was caught away, using the same expression here used for Moses. I was caught away in the spirit of the Lord, yea unto an exceeding high mountain. Well, did he imagine he saw it? Or was he the spirit actually carried him? You notice in that second Nephi, he said his body was carried up, which I never before had seen, and upon which I never before had set foot. The spirit said to me, Behold, what desirest thou? So here is another ascension. It's not a transformation, no, it's ascension. We talked about the mountain the last time. Well, there are some other prologues in heaven, and they are important ones. The uh, <coughs> most famous one, of course, is in Job. Should have brought the Old Testament along. In Job, and that was first to be recognized as a drama, because this our first chapter of Moses is a drama here, arranged as such. And Job was recognized long ago as a drama. The uh, use of the waf conversive, you know, people, he, people, gives it away absolutely as a drama because of the stage directions in it. But uh, the theme is every man. It starts out, I would forget the book, Ishayab uh, Eretzus. There was a man. The first word is the man. Ishayab Ba'eratsus. There was a man in the land of Uz. Shmo Iob and his name Iob Shmo and his name was Job. Job his name. Bahaya, she doesn't use a waf conversive, very interesting. This is the narrative part. We haven't got to the drama part. Here's just the introduction. Uh Tom Wayashar. He was perfect and upright. Yer Elohim, he feared the gods and Asar. Uh, Meharag and he, Harag, and he avoided, he, he kept away from sin. But notice, he is the man, he's the archetypal man. It starts out, there was a man in the land of Uz, and he was the perfect man, Tom. He was representative, the perfect man. Tom was and he was upright, he walked straight in all things, fearing God and avoiding evil. So he's our character, and he has to go through all this suffering, as we all know from, from Job. Uh, <clears throat> so, with this archetypal man, beginning, then we have, through the sixth verse of the first chapter, already you have the uh, prologue in heaven, where the 
all the heavenly hosts are come together and Satan comes among them uh, with his challenge to God and so forth. And uh, it says, Has you seen, have you seen my friend Job and the like? But, uh, and then Job, you know what the, what the situation is, that uh, he, is, he, he is Satan, he comes before the Lord, and he uh, challenges him. And the Lord says, have you seen anyone like my servant Job? And he says, yes, but he, he hasn't been really tried. You put him to a real trial, and he'll turn against you. He'll, he'll denounce you, or renounce you. And uh, Job says, uh, the Lord says, no, and he says, all right, we'll give it a try. Remember, we, we here, and we've been told, we will allow Satan, our common enemy, to try man and to tempt him. So the Lord says, I will allow you to try him and to tempt him all the way, just so you spare his life. That's all, but everything else. Well, then you know what Job has to go through and the like. And his friends come and comfort him in dramatic speeches. And their names show, incidentally, notice this is not a Bible text. Job is not an Israelite. He's a man of the East. And the free friends that come to him, uh, Eliphaz uh, the Temanite, Eliphaz is very interesting uh, because the name is significant. It, it means uh, uh, a, a soft liver. Uh, a, uh, the Temanite means in the, in the, of the lowlands. The uh, Bildad, uh, the Shuhite, well, the, no, Temanite means, means the south country, the pleasant country, the Tamim. It's used in the, in the Songs of Solomon about the gentle wind that blows from the Tamim. Uh, the Taman is the, is the lowlands of the south, the spring country. So it's Eliphaz the Temanite, and then it's Bildad the Shuhite, isn't it? And uh, uh, Bildad, Balada, of course, the root, you don't find that word in, again, notice it's an Arabic root, it's not, not Hebrew. Bildad means far away, a man from a distance, Bildad. The uh, Shuhite, and that means from dwells in the lowland, in the low valleys, in the low plain. And then there is, uh, so far, the uh, <coughs> Natmathite. And uh, so far, means vain, twittering, superficial. See, they all come to advise him and tell him what he should do. Uh, and they're safe. Uh, they have it easy. They're easy livers. And they, they notice these are tribes not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. They come from distant places. We're dealing with another culture now. It's very old. And, uh, and the Naphtalite, uh, the Natmatite, the <coughs> Natmatite, Naam, of course, is, is pleasant, beautiful, easy, soft going, and all that. So he has, has his easy living friends, you might say, that come to, uh, Tipur, that's a good name, Topar, uh, to comfort him, and he uh, and he gives them the, these various speeches. But they come, you see, from a different cycle, uh, and this is explained later in the Book of Mor Moses, uh, where these things come from. The most famous of the dramas all, however, is that of Faust. You all know Faust, the most famous drama of modern times. Uh, Goethe from the uh, dis discovery of manuscripts more recently, started to write it before 1775. Nobody knows when. He was born in, in 49, right in the middle of the century there. Uh, so he's quite young when he began it. And he didn't finish it until 1831. He finished second Faust. That means 51 years, doesn't it? And after all these years, he um, then it was uh, not to be, uh, to be punished, uh, published posthumously. The second part was to be published after he was dead. So how many years from after the church was founded before, so Joseph Smith couldn't very well have used it, could he? Because it's so very close with this passage of Moses. We must pay all, uh, call attention to it here. So, uh, and it begins with the prologue in heaven. I forgot the text. Of course, I remember some of it. I held, I'm glad of that. But I had it already to bring him up. That, that would have slowed us down anyway. You have to get along. You don't have too much time. But uh, it begins with the prologue in heaven. Die Sonne taint nach alter Weise in Brüdersohn und in Brüdersohn und Wettgesang und ihre vorgeschriebene Reise vollendet sie mit Donnerklang. It begins with the music of the spheres. It begins with a multiplicity of worlds, with the plurality of worlds here. Uh, it starts out the endless old age cycling of the spheres in which the sun has co just completed an eniotus, has just completed a cycle. Notice it's the beginning of all things. It takes us back to the cosmos. Notice it's cosmic. Die Sonne taint nach alter Weise. See from in its immemorial fashion, the sun again sounds as it reaches a certain point. It happens to be Easter. It happens to be the spring equinox in the play. Uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, what is it? Uh, 
Oh, Breeder Sverin. Breeder Sverin. Uh, that's right. In uh, uh, that song, in in rivalry, in cooperation, in cooperative rivalry, good nature because he was his brother. With the brother spheres, it revolves with the, all the other spheres of the universe, and in this course, it reaches its beginning part. Yes, uh, and uh, in its Forgesch Friedman Reise, its pre-described cycle, it comes back again to where it started, and. Uh, and, and completes it with a roar of thunder. And then uh, when it comes there, it brings strength, it brings renewed strength to everything, you see. Uh, der Anblick gibt den Engel stärker, uh, then keiner ihn ergreifen mag. The sight of it, the sight of it brings strength to the angels, to all the forces, you see. Though it's, it's unfathomable what it is, the, what the force and the, and the power is. Uh, und, uh, Oh, yes. The unbegreiflich hohen Werke sind herrlich wie am ersten Tag. Yes. And the incomprehensibly exalted creations are glorious as they were on the day of creation. We're right back at the new year again. So here's your old cosmic cycle that you're going to get throughout the literature. But it, not just that, you see, you go back to the oldest monuments of the human race. It's an absolute obsession with the Egyptians. And this is a new development in Egyptian studies, too. So this idea of the constant return as an earnest of our own resurrection and so forth, because all nature is renewed and the like. So we get this, uh, this is the opening chorus. And there's a council in heaven. And in <coughs> reverse order, in order of their importance, the, the, uh, the angels speak, first Raphael, then Gabriel, and then Michael. They all speak and they, uh, each praising the glories of nature and of the creation and the Lord, and then the Lord speaks and uh, the, uh, it's a hymn of creation, is what it is. It's very, there's the angel chorus, you see. They resume again, they all, then they all three thing, sing together with a, a slight variation. They're on the beating, and go stärker. Then, yes, then kind of. Dish agreement. This time it says Dish agreement. Mars. <coughs> and all the Dinah Hohenwerken, simply herrlich für Mersten Tag. It comes right again. The angels uh, sing the chorus. Notice this is the chorus of creation. Uh, Walter Otto, the great uh, um, collector and coordinator of German uh, of, uh, of Greek literature, classic literature, Walter Otto, at the end of all his work, he wrote a book called The Muses, which I think we have here, Die Musen, in which he shows what the word poem comes from. Poem is the creation song. It's the song that was sung on the day of creation. Poema means creation, see, actually. Uh, poyo is to make, and poema is the act of creating. And when the creation was completed, then what happened? Well, we get that from Job again, you see. Uh, the sons of God shouted together, all the sons of God, the angels sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy at the sight of the creation, of the new world that was created going forth. So here we have the, uh, the creation song, and it's being sung here in Goethe's play. Uh, to start out being sung, sung by the angels here, it is returned. And this poem, well, of course, it's a chorus. The Greek plays, of course, you have to have a chorus. And what does a chorus mean? A chorus is a ring dance, it's a circle. See, a chorus is a circle, choral. Uh, same as our word curve, curvus, Latin curvus, see a curve going around. Uh, now, and the chorus sings, and the Greek chorus is supposed to sing, and the chorus of the muses sings the poema, the creation song. Remember, the nine muses have to, each one is in, in charge of one department of describing and studying one department of the creation. And so they all get together, and when they sing together, it's the poema, the song of the creation. So it's a glorious thing. It's a round dance, like the Egyptian maypole. And it's the music of the spheres and those things we've heard about in literature. Well, then what happens? Immediately Satan enters in this, this one here, as in Job. And his name is Mephistopheles. And this indicates his role and assignment. Later, when he appears to Faust in the chamber, uh, Faust asks him, Verbistodon. And he says, I'm tired from Jena Prof, he states das Beuzeville, and states das Gute Schaff. And he says, his only, his only task is to destroy, to tear down. He must react. He can't act. He can only react. His business is entirely negative. And somebody has to have that role. It's an assignment, he says. He gives it as that. Uh, because uh, the word Mephistopheles means, Mephis means spite, evil, rancor. He wants to do as badly as he can. He's out to make mischief, you see. Uh, but Ophiles, Ophileo, means to do good, to help somebody, to help the plan along, to assist in things. So 
He's a, he plays a necessary role. Without him there, you're not going to have any play or any, anything else. So Mephistopheles is the one, as he says, the states that's Bezerville, who always wants to do evil and only succeeds in doing good. And states that's Bezerville, and of course it drives him wild. <laughs> he can't lose. I'm always comparing him with the, with the uh, roadrunner and the, and the coyote. The coyote has these fiendish and clever devices. They always backfire, and so it is with Satan. This marvelous passage we get from the book of Moses, it's the, uh, is it from the first uh, chapter? Well, I, what? it's in the seventh. He sought, it says, Satan sought to destroy the world, for he knew not the mind of God. That, I think, is the most encouraging verse in all the scriptures. Satan seems to be getting the upper hand all the time, and, uh, but he doesn't know the mind of God. There's, there's a lot of things he doesn't know. But that is reassuring because he seems to be ruling things like that verse by Clarence Day. Might and right are always fighting. In our youth it seems exciting. Right is always nearly winning. Might can hardly keep from grinning. Because might always wins in the end in this earth. But anyway, the Mephistopheles comes and he's come to report. He says, since God has been asking for reports. I wish I brought the Mahatogun Oregano with me. <laughs> Because God has been asking to report. The angels come and report, and he's reported, and he doesn't think so much of the way things are going on the earth. Uh, he says, as in olden times, we used to be friends, and it refers to the time when he was Lucifer, you see, in, in a verse here, in olden times. He says, uh, when we met under, under friendlier circumstances, but here I am again to report anyway, whether you want it or not, he's rather defiant here. And... Uh, he says he's confined now. He can't go out and visit other worlds. He's been cast down and confined to this world, he says, where little man is the little god, and he thinks he rules things, he says. And then he says he would be better off, man would be better off without the shine dissimulation. If he didn't have a memory of his divine origin, there you are again, man would be better off because he says it just spoils him. He starts pushing people off the sidewalks. He thinks he has it made and so forth. He says he's irrational, says Goethe. He says he's rational, but he acts like an animal. And uh, so this is a challenge to God. Is, this, is the creation a success? Is the plan for the human race working out at all? Or is, a, is it a terrible bungle? Uh, what do you say to this? See, now, now Goethe, uh, the purpose, one of the main purposes of the play is to banish religion from the scene. He doesn't want that in at all. He was a, a marvelous man. When he was very young, he, uh, he uh, saw through philosophy, wouldn't have anything to do with that. And, he wanted to get down to solid, the most solid information he could. He went into all branches of the science. Well, he was a universal mind, one of the great thinkers of all time. But, uh, and he sums it up in this play over so many years. Written, he worked on this play so much. See, this, this brings his thought together. And, of course, in his middle period, the, uh, when he was with Herder and so forth, he was, uh, uh, it was a very literary period. And then uh, Herder acquainted him with, uh, with uh, Schiller. Uh, with, they became friends there. And then the Weimar period, when, uh, became so close to Shakespeare and to Homer and the Greeks and so forth. So he brings all these elements in. He's aware of these things, and he sees they fit in somewhere. But, uh, and then the Lord says, when he replies, so he says, to, he says to Satan here, so you're always the accuser, aren't you? You never can say anything good. Don't you, can't you ever say anything good about anybody? He says, you never do, because Satan is the accuser. And what is the Greek word for accuser? It's diabolus, devil. Say, diabolus is to accuse. Diabolao is to accuse somebody. And as the Talmud says, he never accuses falsely. When he accuses, he accuses rightly, but that doesn't make him saintly. Uh, people do wrong, but you have no business being the accuser. Remember, Satan is the accuser of his fellow men. Four things you must never do. One of them is accuse, never accuse. Uh, because that will block you off from the ways of repentance, which you need. Diabolus, and that, of course, is our word devil, the Diabolus. Well, from the Bay region, or about Mount Diablo. Well, the Diabolus is the devil. The accuser, remember, in the scripture, he's called the accuser of his brethren. And Adam, in replying to him, says, uh, The Lord judge thee, Adam, I will not bring a reigning accusation against thee. As Brigham Young says, I do not accuse Satan. He is doing his job manfully. He's filling his mission, which he's supposed to. I'm not going to accuse him. I'm going to accuse myself when I fall short. But th there he's there as the accuser, and his business is to foul things up. And he says to the Lord, things aren't going well on earth, the human race is not doing too well, and challenges God to a ra uh, wager uh, that he can tempt man. See, just as, just as in Job, he's following Job. Him. That he can tempt man and make him fall. 
And the Lord says, all right, she's in your hand again. And uh, again, we will allow, we will allow him, our common enemy, to try man and tempt him. And then the tent, and then the test begins and the opening scene. We'll have to get back to Moses to see how closely this follows now. But first, we might as well see where this leads us. Then the curtain goes up, the, that's the prologue. The lights go down, this is in heaven, it's brilliant, it's light. And then, when the curtain rises, and I hope you've read the first chapter, some of you, uh, I'm sure, uh, and it's dark. It's called, the whole long first act is called Nacht, it's night. And uh, the, he finds himself in a dark chamber, in a dark tower at midnight. Nothing could be darker, and his spirit is absolutely black. He's reached the end of his rope here. And uh, he's uh, at the end of his line here. The whole thing, he says there's no joy in it. The whole thing is a farce. He takes in Habanun, Achillos, Philos lines as he recites, I've studied these things, I've learned everything. And where does it get? Ishtedaris, Armatorum, Biso, Arms, Biso, Ish. I'm a toy and be so clue God speaks for him. Be so clue I'm no more clever than I ever was, no sharper than I ever was, and, and after all that study, where has it gotten? And then he reflects on his way of life. Does it start and does I say, you call that living, you see. He says it's worth kind of so long life. No dog would live longer like this. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put up with it anymore, he says. And uh, having reached by and he sees nothing but hard times ahead, he's completely disillusioned. Also, he's very poor and he's ignored. He hasn't Though he's the most famous man in the world, for he's Dr. Faustus. He's, there was a real Dr. Faustus in the 16th century. Some attribute the inventing printing to him. Uh, only a magician could have done that, and so forth. But the great there's Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. You know Dr. Faustus. The same thing. The theme of redemption and the like. If you read Marlowe's Faustus, see how Christ's blood streams through the firmament. One drop of it will save me. Oh my Christ, and so forth. When he goes through the same thing that this Faust goes through, uh, but. Uh, he turns to his hermetic books. He says, well, there's nothing to do. He's going to uh, apply to magic just to satisfy himself. He has, sees no future or anything. The world doesn't interest him. He's lost on this, but I'm going to drum habish mich der Magie ergeben, da ich nicht mehr mit saurem Schweiß, and so forth, that I don't have to say with sour sweat things that I don't know. Uh, Schau alle Wirklichkeit zusammen. Uh, und Samen, isn't it? Not zusammen, but und Samen. That I might see all truth and the sources of all things and not just fool around with terminology the rest of my life, the way they do in the schools, and Tunish, Merriman, Court, and Common. Remember, that's what happened to Clement, the young Clement in the school. He said he went to all the doctors, and all they did was talk about words and argue with each other in terms of terminology. Well, so that's a world that's all so silly. And some, uh, from a hermetic book, he summons up a spirit. Now, in Marlowe's Faust, it isn't Satan who guides him through, but it's a familiar spirit whom Satan, with whom Satan puts him in touch. The same sort of thing happens here. Uh, but he decides on suicide. He's going to end it. The, the Hermetic book uh, calls up a spirit, but no dice. It's all the more discouraging, and he decides on suicide. And just as he puts the poison to his lips, the dawn comes, and he hears an Easter chorus, because it is Easter. It is the spring equinox. It's the return of the sun, as the opening chorus said. The sun has come back again. It's new life, and he says, Die Erde hat mich wieder. I'm, I'm back on earth again. He's going to give it another try. And... Uh, it sings, the Easter chorus sings, wouldn't you know it, of the resurrection. But again, that's one thing he can't take. That's one thing the doctors of the church couldn't take. St. Augustine says, an afterlife, yes, but resurrection, that's absurd. St. Augustine, mind you. Uh, resurrection, he says, for those who pass the test. And then that the famous line, he says, well, I get the message. It's marvelous. It's marvelous Easter message. Of course, in, uh, in Europe, Easter is the big thing, especially in Germany. It's the great festival of the year. And the Botschaft hier ist wohl allein mehr fertig habe. I hear the message, but I, I just can't believe it. That's, that's all that's wrong with it. So Faust takes an Easter walk, and he's followed home by a black poodle, which becomes a rather sinister object, follows him into the room. <coughs> Again, this may go back to Andrew of Constantinople. They used to use poodles for, for divination and so forth. And Andrew was famous in the uh, 10th century for having a, I think it's 10th century, yes, for having a 10th or 11th, for having a talking dog. And that electrified the world, Andrew's talking dog. Everybody knows about Andrew's talking dog. He tries more conjuring, and Satan appears. So now Satan appears. And he tells him his name and his office, that he is the destroyer. He does not act, but he reacts, and he's always against something. And then Faust says, what's the deal? And Mephisto says, I'm going to make a deal with you. 
I serve you here, you serve me there. Now that's the famous pact with the devil. That comes later on in our book of Moses. And it's very, very vividly set forth there, better than anywhere else. Uh, and Faust accepts. Moses does not accept, as you know. Uh, and so we're back to the prologue and we get to Moses' calling here. Uh, and again, let me refer you to another great prologue that begins a story, namely the opening episode of the Book of Mormon is the prologue in heaven. We sometimes overlook that. You look at the first chapter here, mentioned it before, and we begin with the eighth verse. See, uh, the first part is a colophon, uh, Nephi summing up his situation and the situation of the, uh, uh, of the world at that time, and then he gets down to his story in his own family, and it came to pass about his father, you see. And Verse 7, he returned to his own house, cast himself on Jerusalem, and then things begin. Now things start moving. This is the revelation that starts this uh, Le Lehi's dispensation, you might call it. Being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision. He gets carried away. Here's an ascension again, you see. Even that he saw the heavens open, ah, he sees the heavens open, and this is the ascension to heaven. And he thought he saw God sitting on his throne. There is the theme. The heavenly hosts are assembled around God on his throne. <coughs> that is the, but you notice, <coughs> it is putting it as a vision. He thought he saw God sitting on it. It was as if he experienced it. Because he's going way back in time. This is the council in heaven at the foundation of the earth. He's beginning to see. Let's not forget the Shabako stone there. Let's not forget the Enuma Elish, but especially the Memphite theology, where the oldest record of the human race tells us about this council in heaven. And here we have it again. He thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numerous concourses of angels. A concourse is a circle. A concourse is, of course, numerous concourses. It means circles within circles. and reminds you, of course, of Dante and that. Uh, and what were they doing? Surrounded. Surrounded means all around. There's the round. It's the angel chorus singing. What they're doing is the angel chorus. In the attitude of singing and praising their God. It was a choral dance. The attitude of singing and praising their God. Um, and it came to pass that he saw one descending out of the midst of heaven and beheld his luster above that of the noonday. Now he saw the various spirits assigned to their work on earth and their coming and their descending to, on their various missions. He sees the twelve come down in the Lord. Now this was all planned at that time, and this hadn't happened yet, and this was what makes Lehi rejoice. He sees it's going to be all right. He sees the plan of salvation. He also saw twelve others following him, and their brightness did exceed that of the stars of the firmament. They came, notice the cosmic element in here, too, the stars of the firmament and all the rest of it. They came down and went forth upon the face of the earth, and the first came and stood before my father, and gave unto him a book, as in John, in the revelation of John, the giving of the book, the bitter book that you eat, the eating of the book, the book that tastes like honey, or the book that tastes like wormwood. The eating of the book is a very important element, in fact, Gil Wittengren, the Swede, has written a book on that subject, a book about a book. This book is important, and bade him that he should read. And it came to pass that he read and was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Notice, what are we? What is this image? What world are we in with? He read, he read, first he told him to eat the book, and so he read it. In this case, case he not to eat it, but he reads it. But he's filled with the Spirit of the Lord, and he read, saying, this is what it says, Woe to Jerusalem, and so forth, the abominations of Jerusalem, that it should be destroyed in the inhabitants thereof, etc. When my father had read, seen and read these great and marvelous things, he did exclaim thing, great things unto the Lord, such as Mjed, typical Egyptian phrases, such as. Then he said, he said such a thing, and then you put after it Mjed or Erjed, such as to say the following. Such as, great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Now, this sounds like the creation hymn, doesn't it? Great and mighty are thy works, thine vericus and herlich via mercy the works are unbegreiflich um, hoher, the incomprehensible, exalted works are glorious as on the day of creation. He says it here. Lord God Almighty, thy throne is high in the heavens, and thy power and goodness and mercy are over all the inhabitants of the earth. Because thou art merciful, thou wilt not suffer those who shall come to thee to perish. And this, after this manner was the language of my father. Notice he says, I'm just giving it to you, my own version. After this manner was thy, this is not a, that is not a direct quote, you see. This is the sort of thing. See, we're dealing with the types. We're dealing with types and images here, and you can shift them around. This is formulaic literature, which is perfectly fair, because these things are uh, will lead no one astray. For his soul did rejoice, his whole heart was filled because of the things which he had seen, yea, which the Lord had shown to him. So I make a full not a full account of the things which my father wrote. So here we have the prologue in heaven again, beginning <coughs> the great book of Mormon. And we fit it in the plan, of course, Abraham 3, the third chapter of Abraham, we, we've mentioned that before. That is the council in heaven, very clear, from the 22nd to the 28th verse. That's a pretty long account of it. Here, and uh, 
the uh, the third and uh, I'm looking third of Moses. Oh, let me get mixed up here. Here we are. Now I, Abraham, was shown the intelligences that were organized before the world was, and among all these were a great many and noble ones. And oh, let me remember one, another important one. Uh, in the Odyssey, there's a marvelous one. That, the very the book begins. The Odyssey begins with accounts in heaven. It gives a brief account. Andromeda was first, like Job. It begins. The first word is. This is the upright and perfect man. The Odyssey begins, Sing to the man. The first word, this is like Ish Haya. There was a man. The Odyssey begins, Tell me, muse, about the man. But the first word is the man who had to suffer so much and go through so much, seeking to save his soul and to bring his fellow men through as best he could because he was a magnanimous spirit. He, why couldn't he do it, and what went wrong, and so forth? Well, I tell you. And so it begins already. It begins in the, uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> about the 16th, 18th line, right at the beginning of the Odyssey, where it says, "Now there was a the Most High God, the Father of gods and men, called an assembly of all the gods in heaven to meet at, at Olympus in the in the palace of Olympus in the high halls above." <clears throat> for some time. And they all came, except Poseidon. He takes the role of Poseidon. He, he holds back. And incidentally, the word shaitan, Satan, means the one who holds back, the one who lies in ambush. The one, shaitana, satan, shaitana means to hold back. Shaitan is the person who, as I say, who lies in ambush, who holds back, who will not cooperate. And Poseidon didn't come. Another famous one, right out of Faust, <coughs> the most famous epic of the Middle Ages, and there's, was the Reinecke Faust, Renard the Fox. You know about Renard the Fox. It was upon a Sinksendag, and it was on a Sinksen day, it was on at the spring equinox, uh, when the, everything was green, to buy the Bosque and the Hage mit Grün und Löwen von Befan, that by uh, the bush and the and the trees were covered with the first green leaves. It was a marvelous time. Nobel de Kunix, Noble the King, had sent his criers out to summon all the animals to his presence to celebrate creation, as you should say. Nobel de Kunix had a gedan sein Hofkrieron, Krieron, his Hofkriers, his court criers, über alle da kommen, hode his gefall, that they would come at his command. Alle de regroten de Kleine, all the animals, great and small, boot down, fos, renart, de Lena, except Reynard alone, except Reynard the father. Er, yeah, he had us, uh, the hope so feeling is done that he had in the doors to gone. He had done so many wicked things that he didn't dare appear before, <laughs> before the king at court. But he does appear, you see. And then we have others. There is uh, the marvelous one in the, uh, the Locusena. That's one of the great, uh, one of the great Eddas, where the courts all meet and Loki comes. Loki is Satan, you see. And he comes and defies God, and he defies all the rest of the gods, but the locus center, his refusal to cooperate. So it's a very common image you're going to get throughout the world. And here's the Renica Fos, the sly Renica the Fox. Notice he's both sly and curious, and yet uh, he's very intelligent, he's very clever, and uh, like Loki, he is dangerous. <coughs> and so we have this in, in the Odyssey, it begins here. and. Uh, his opening speech, the opening speech is that of Zeus himself. And then it says, the gods, of, uh, God, father of men, spell, O popoi hoi on thine throne, O how men, uh, how men, I tell uh, blame the gods, Theus, Theus, I tell blame the gods for all their misfortunes and all that comes, come from, uh, actually, gar autosi 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 because it's only their own foolishness and their own pride and their own stubbornness refusal to repent, that brings all their troubles on them, that makes them uh, suffer more than they algehusen, hypomoron, hypermoron algehusen. They suffer more than they need to suffer, hypermoron, more, more than they need to at all, algehusen, they suffer more than they need to because of their own atastalioisia long term. Uh, down on earth, meantime, Odysseus has been being held back in a cave by, by a, a very charming enchantress, um, Calypso de Atao, in That's a marvelous story about he's held back there. Well, anyway, you see, this is a theme. It's a universal theme. Yes, sir, Brother Ben? Uh, is there an etymological connection here between Shaitan and Poseidon? 
Uh, Potaidon. It's a very interesting word. The word Potaidon. It's been uh, analyzed uh, by uh, Curtius and others. Uh, Potaidon is the way is the old ways with a T instead of an S. Just like in Attic, you put a T. Where in the other Greek dialects, you put an S. And so uh, it's Potaidon, the Lord of the the possessor, uh, the Potos of the underworld. He's the Gaiokon. He's the earth shaker. And he comes in here when Satan departs from. Remember when Satan uh, departs from uh, Moses. He uh, lets out a great cry and the earth shakes. Well, Poseidon's regular epithet in Homer is Gaeochos, which means either the possessor of the, of the earth, he who rules this earth, Ochos, Echos, but is nearly always translated, probably wrongly, earth as earth shaker, yes. He's both the earth shaker and the earth holder. If he holds it, he shakes it. See? So it goes back to the, the common thing that he is of this earth, under the earth, and of course, he is Plutus and he is his wealth too. And this comes in. Now, what... Uh, when, uh, well, well, we'll get to that a little later, but let's see this marvelous section here. We're leaving the, uh, we're leaving the good part out. Section one to nine is this prologue, uh, and it is, uh, it is most wonderful, you see. Just like that, the, the council in heaven. And this is where we fit in. This is the plan uh, where we, did we just read from Abraham? Three, 22 and 23, yes. God saw these souls, they were good. He stood in the midst of them. See, he's surrounded on all sides. These I will make my rulers. He stood among those that were spirits. They saw that they were good. Abraham, thou art one of them. He stood among them, was like unto God. And he said unto him, who will go down? See, they're discussing the plan and the sort of thing. And what happens? And Satan, he steps up and makes his challenge here. Uh, and the Lord said, whom shall I send? And one answered, like unto the Son of Man, here I am sent even the other answered, here I am sent me. And the Lord said, I will send the first. And the second was angry and kept not his first estate. And at that day, many followed after him. So here we have the revolt again, just as we had Horus and Seth in the presence of, uh, of Ta in the beginning of the, uh, in the, beginning of the Memphis uh, text, the Shabako text. So here we go. And the Lord speaks to Moses, and he gives him his name, which is endless. If you ask the, the rabbis, what is the only name? See, all we know God by is epithets, things describing him. Uh, the Quran says there are 95 names of God. They're not names, they're epithets. Every name is an epithet. And it's something that describes a character. If you're Rufus, it means you're red-headed. If you're Curtis, it means you're short, and so forth. And uh, there's nobody here whose name doesn't, we should go down the roll, whose name doesn't actually mean something. And uh, he says, my name is endless. And notice it's capitalized in our books, and it should be. Because I say, if you ask the rabbis, what is the, the ultimate name you can call him by? It's still an epithet, but it is Ein Sof, means who has no end. There, the Sof is the limit, the boundary, but there is no boundary to either, well, he tells us, either in space or in time, he is unlimited. So is that not endless? So he's the Ein Sof. And uh, endless is my name. Again, the importance of the name, we saw that. The, uh, there's no end to my works or my words. He works and words coming out in all of these things. You, they must go together because the works mean nothing unless they're communicated, unless they're shared. For I am without beginning of days or end of years. Notice, that's time, in time. And notice right across the alley there in verse 6, it says, There is no God beside me, and all things are present with me. That means present in place, present in time. If I can be there, it's present. If it's right now, it's present. Remember present? Remember, we use the very same terms for time that we do for space. Present, we don't use absent the same way, but the present is what it, whatever is here. Uh, you, you can never make the statement, I am not here, and you can never make the statement, it is not now. Those statements are always false, because you are always here and you are always now. Nobody else is here, and <laughs> no other time is now, but when you, when you perceive it, strange paradoxes, aren't they? And he says, I am the Lord God Almighty, endless is my name, for I am without beginning of days, and end of years is not this endless, meaning no limits, no so. Now here comes the second one. He's introduced himself, see, and and this is when a when a god in ancient literature, when a god describes himself, it's called an aritology. And this is a typical aritology. Uh, when somebody else described him and praises him, uh, that's an acclamatio, that's an acclamation or a laus. A laudis, laudis is praises, you see. But aritology, ar, arete is verse, is virtue. Arete is virtue, quality. The high qualities and virtues of a person are arete, very common Greek word. You know. And uh, 
our autology is proclaiming your particular office, calling, function, and so forth. So the, fame, the most famous of them all is the I am Isis. The Egyptians, the Greeks took it over. I am Isis, and then she describes herself. And that's an aratology. Well, this is an aratology. He says, I, the Lord God, I'm almighty, I'm endless, and my name without beginning of days and ends of years is done. And then he says to Moses how he is related to him. Why I am bothering to tell you this. Why I am bothering to talk to you. Remember, the brother of Jared says, he talked to me in all humility as one man to another. Now, that's what humility is. It is not being bowing the knee in presence of overwhelming superiority or power or glory. Anybody can do that, you see. But it is recognizing that other creatures, small, very unimportant creatures, are just as good as you are and are unequal with you. That's, that's what humility is. Humility I means when you put yourself on the level with them. And, and so the brother of Jared says, he talked with me as one man to another in all humility. Well, it was humility for him, uh, but it was all humility for the the brother of Jared, too, you notice how he was smitten down when he held up the rocks. Well, thou art my son. After saying all the, after the aratology, he says, now, this is where you come in. You are my son. And in the Gospel of Philip, there's a, it says an astonishing thing. He says, we want to know what God is. He says, well, a, a horse begets a horse. A dog begets a dog. A bull begets a bull. And what does a God beget if a God has a son? What can, it, what can it possibly be except a God? Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the problem here. If you were the son of such a being, uh, there's a lot of explaining to do here. And therefore you're qualified, and I'm going to show you a few things. Look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands, but not all we've seen, for my works are without end. There's your aim, Sof again. His works are without end. His presence is without end. His knowledge, everything is without end. And also my words. Remember, the works and the words always go together. The words are to communicate, and the works are what's done. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. For they never cease. They go on and on. So, <coughs> spaceless, timeless. Wherefore, no man can behold all my works, except he behold all my glory. So his works are his glory, to behold his glory. Remember, he says, this is my work and my glory. My work is my glory. That's what it is, to share this with others, to bring about the mortality, internal life, immortality of man. To, to share it with the rest of us. Wherefore, no man can see all my works and behold my glory, and no man can behold all my glory, and afterwards remain in the flesh. We see this. And then, why am I telling you this? Because I have a work for you to do. I'm going to give you assignment. And Joseph, the prophet Joseph, says, every one of us received an assignment before he came here. And you better find out what it is and do it. Eh? Uh, I have a work, and thou art in the similitude of mine only begotten. Now, not only is he his son, but uh, he's in the similitude and the likeness, as the Son is in the similitude of the Father, he's in the likeness of the Only Begotten. And mine Only Begotten is and shall be the Savior who is full of grace and truth. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting, of course, where he says is in, and shall, because it's ether. It refers to the book of Ether 3, 8, and 9. I've noticed here. I won't go to that. And shall be the Savior, for he is full of grace and truth, but there is no God beside me. Notice, you will call upon Father... Uh, it tells us later on in the book of Moses here, call upon, he was commanded to call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. If you call upon God, then God only, but always in the name of the Son. So, he is full of grace and truth, and of course those are the qualities, full of grace and truth. Uh, well, how do you define grace? Well, that's Karis, that's everything good. But Karis is your attitude toward others, toward, toward everything else, and it's one, of course, of complete love, and her grace is charis, the Greek charis, our word cheer, and they're all related, Latin gratia, which means thanks, grace, and so forth. Uh, grace is the lack, remember, we just described Mephistopheles as all negative, all willing to destroy. This is the absolute opposite of that, you see. There is no shadow of that in it at all. It's full of grace and truth. <coughs> nothing false, nothing deceiving, nothing phony, whereas Satan, on the other hand, is the one who loves and makes him lie. He was a liar in the beginner. He is the deceiver. He's as well as Apollyon, the destroyer. He works by trickery and by lies. He's called the father of lies. And this is the opposite. The Lord is full of grace and truth. So to what point do we repent in this life or any other life? Repent until you are full of grace and truth. So I think we can all need some repentance. Don't call upon anybody else to repent until you repent. And that will be when you are full of grace and truth. And that's a long ways off for some people. Be full of grace and truth. We can't even conceive of what that would be like. 
But that's the object. That's, the, that's what we're after. Well, now, I'm going to limit you to this one thing because I have one assignment. He says, this one thing, I tell you, focus on the thing we're supposed to do, Moses. My son, for thou art in the world, and I'll show it unto thee. I'll show you the world you're in. You mentioned this before, the anthropic principle. The point of view you're at determines where you are, determines everything the way it will appear to you and be to you, because you have to act from that point. You don't see everything, you don't move in all directions, and you don't know what's behind you at this very moment. And it came to pass that Moses looked and he beheld the world upon which he was created. That was his world. And Moses beheld the world and the ends thereof and all the children of men which were created and the same he greatly marveled and wondered. And then, that's the end of the prologue. Then the lights go down and the stage is dark. And as in Faust and as in Job, we see our hero. And as in, in the Odyssey, he's in a, in a cave, you see. In Glufer, in, uh, in Glufer, see Glufer, in space, see Glufer, see. He's, he's in prison, but this is in, in, in a cave, a crystal cave under the ground. Uh, uh, by Calypso, and of course she means the one who hides you, the, the hidden one, the dark one, the witch. So here we're getting these heroes all in the same position. As soon as we leave the, the prologue in heaven, we find them in the dark. The presence of God withdrew from Moses, and his glory was not on Moses. The lights go down. He was left to himself, and as he was left unto himself, he fell to the earth. Uh, remember, Joseph Smith says that, remember? I found myself lying on my back. It was, complete. It was some time before I could regain my strength, he says, remember? And uh, the same thing here. It came to pass it was for the space of many hours before he regained his strength. So as the play opens, we have Moses lying alone there in the dark and dreary world, all alone uh, and uh, out cold. I mean, the, the picture of helplessness. He's reached the bottom. You can't go lower than this. Well, this is a fine way to begin your career on Earth. It's a fine way to launch. Uh, how, how auspicious a beginning is this? And as he began to receive his natural strength, he pulls himself together. And he says to himself this great truth, of course, now I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. Uh, oh, Guinness, oh, Guinness Anthropone, oh, human race, how I esteem you as nothing, as the Greek chorus says. Uh, and of course, we see a lot of that, too. Where's that come from? Man is nothing, what? Where's that come from about the human race esteem? I, I really, now let me see. It isn't from either of the Oedipus t uh, plays, but it is from, let me see, now what is it from? Uh, Hoste, uh, he doesn't use I tell, yes. Uh, anti, yes, uh, anti within, as equal to exactly nothing. How I, anti, how, no, anti me then. How I estimate you as equal to exactly nothing, he says. Well, I have to look it up. I can't even remember the play. So it could come from any play, because this is it's the same thing. This is necessary. The Greek tragedy is man's condition on earth, and what's going on, how he gets himself into it, and how he gets out of it. But uh, Moses says this, this cause I know that man is nothing. He's seen what is up there, and he's seen what's down here. Man is, the, is on earth where he was created. And he never supposed that before. <coughs> uh, which thing I never had supposed? Uh, and incidentally, in First Oedipus, how you get that in Oedipus Rex, when Tiresias, the seer, comes on the stage, the first thing he does, he looks, he's blind, but he faces the Athenian audience and says, all of you know nothing. He says, pontes ou phronon. All of you know nothing, pontes ou phronon. All of you know nothing, so don't fool yourself. And nobody will understand Tiresias since he's a seer and a prophet. Well, but now, he says, now here is, the con here is the, here's the contrast. If he's nothing, then how about being so close to God? But now mine eyes have beheld God. Uh, but not my natural eyes, but my spiritual eyes, for my natural eyes could not have beheld them. Now, now are we trying to escape the issue here by calling it spiritual or the like? No. Uh, the spiritual packs a greater energy than the physical. You see, f uh, spirit is a form of energy, just as just as faith is a form of energy, and, and love is, and joy. The strange things you can't define, but then you can't define the four forces anyway, can you? But it's a real and substantial thing, as far as this goes. The, the spirit, it's one of the real forces. It's a real, let's say, form of energy, let it go at that. For I should have withered and died in his presence, but his glory was upon me, and I beheld his face, for I was transfigured before him. The, uh, he was, notice he was, again, he was carried up, and he was in the presence of God, and he was in another 
he was on another level, in another uh, energy zone, and he could do it, as he says here. Not my natural, but my spiritualized, my spiritualized, for my natural eyes could not have beheld him. I was transfigured before him. Now, that's the transfiguration on the mountain, you see. Well, this is up, but notice, now that's the end of that act. Remember, a new scene. A new scene is when a new character enters. And now the play begins, because you have to have an antagonist and a protagonist in a play. And now Satan enters the scene. Notice, when the hero is at his lowest, when he's most helpless, that is the time that Satan strikes. When he gets him into the greatest possible disadvantage. Satan does not play fair. He's going to make all the disruption. He can uh, unbalance you. He can destabilize governments and things like that. He likes to take advantage and destroy and knock down. Nothing is to be gained by that anywhere, even though it's the wicked you're fighting and so forth. But here, when he said these words, Satan came tempting him, saying, Moses, son of man, worship me. Here he takes, he takes advantage of him uh, in his weakness. And this happens. You see, Faust, he's ready to commit suicide. He's in the dark and so forth, and Satan appears to him there. And uh, the same thing with Job. Uh, here is the tempters, his, his companions, come to him then. Uh, but remember, it's Satan who is... Who is exerting his power over Job. Remember the Lord said to Satan at the beginning, he's, I put him in your hand, but you spare his life. So Satan is doing it. So this is a stock drama, and since it starts out by Ish and Andra, the man, the man, uh, that means everybody. We are to think of ourselves respectively as that. And of course, the man is, is Adam. Uh, Ish is the word Enosh, too. Uh, ben Enosh is a man, and the word Enoch, and the word Enosh is the same all mixed up together, but we're identified with these things. See how these, these flow together in this language is trying to convey to us? But there's quite a difference in the gospel, the way it's given to us by the prophet. He's going to show us finally what the reality is behind this after the human race has dabbled around for thousands of years and, and Gertie worked at it. Oh, he, he sweat blood trying to find out would it really make sense and ends up on a rather sour and a rather negative note, which we don't need to. But I don't think, when was, Gertie, when was the first class first performed? Do you have any idea? He started before 75, they say, and 1808 was when he finished it. That's right. So I doubt if Joseph Smith could have used it for this. I doubt if he did use it. <laughs> but, but second class didn't come until 1831, and this was published in 1830.